This is Carla Jenkins. I'm the Cal-Calf Range Management Specialist for the University of Nebraska at the Panhandle Research and Extension Center. And this is part one of the Confinement Cow Series. Today's topic is Nutritional Considerations for Confinement Feeding Cows. So to begin with, why would we consider confining cows? Due to drought and other natural disasters, as well as crop acres and urbanization, we have a reduced availability of grass. And because of that, the cost of grass leases continues to increase. But we also have an abundant supply of crop residues. And we have a lot of byproducts from various commodities. And those two things together give us tremendous opportunity to rethink cow-calf systems. As we rethink cow-calf systems and think about when cattle might be on grass, what forages we might use, when they might graze residues, it might be that part of that system could involve confining production cows at some point in their production cycle. If we're going to confine production cows at any given point of their production cycle, there are nutritional considerations that we have to think about in order to do this. And so today's topic will include the following. We're going to talk about limit feeding energy dense diets and how that might be the most cost effective way to do this. We're going to talk about the nutritional content of the feeds, the nutritional requirements of the cows, the feed intake that the calf will need, and the nutritional requirement of breeding bulls if they happen to be in confinement with the cows. So to begin with, we have to know the nutrient content of feedstuffs. So we're going to start out by talking about TDN, or total dige digestible nutrients, which is a measure of the energy available for the animal. And specifically, we're going to talk about TDN of byproducts. We always encourage producers to take their feed samples to a commercial laboratory and have them tested for nutrient analysis. And when commercial laboratories calculate TDN, they actually calculate it rather than um, perform a wet chemistry analysis. And they calculate it from acid detergent fiber analysis. And so this calculation works very well for estimating the TDN of forages. But when we start estimating the value of high fiber byproducts, um, the data from feeding trials is really a better estimate of TDN. So this table that I have here is simply the TDN values that have been determined from feeding trials. And I have referenced those feeding trials at the bottom of this slide. So if we are going to um, use any of the corn distillers byproducts in our ration, we would want to use a TDN value of 108. Sugar beet pulp would be 90, soy hulls at 70, synergy at 105, corn gluten feed at 100 wheat mids at 75, and corn at 83. I also included wheat straw or corn stalks that might be the residue component of these diets. And typically, the TDN value of that's about 43%. And I included meadow hay as a reference point. Um, decent quality meadow hay from Sand Hills Meadow might run about 57%. So the first thing that you might notice on this slide is that we typically consider corn to be 90% TDN, and I have it listed here as 83. The reason for that is that corn is 90% TDN in a finishing diet, and these are um, poor quality forage diets if they're residue based. And so when we put corn with that, the starch in corn actually has a negative associative effect on fiber digestion in the rumen. And so the energy value of corn in a, in a low quality, high fiber diet is actually lower than 90. So please keep that in mind. So why is this important to know? Why should we be using the correct values for TDN? Well, feeding cows is expensive. We know that. And when we use TDN values that are too low, that can result in overfeeding the cattle, which is expensive, particularly in a confinement feeding situation. The converse of that is if we use TDN values that are too high, it could result in underfeeding. So in addition to understanding the nutrient value of the feeds that we're using, it's also critically important to understand the nutrient requirements of the cow that we're feeding. 
So the cows up in the first picture at the top have begun to lactate. So they have a very high requirement. Their first limiting nutrient is energy. Even though protein is an important component of their diet, the first limiting nutrient for them is energy. The cows in the bottom of the slide are about mid-gestation, and they are no longer lactating. And so they are at about the lowest point of their energy requirement that they're going to have during their production cycle. So these two pictures represent cows with extremely different needs. And if we're feeding in confinement, we must understand the requirements that each cow has to feed her appropriately and make changes to that if she moves from one part of production into another while in confinement, because we must change the diet then to meet those needs. So this is an example of um, some nutrient requirements of the cows that are on a project at the University of Nebraska. They're actually late June, early July calving cows. And in a study that we did, the red line would represent early weaned cows, so they would have calved reached peak lactation, and then about 90 days after calving, they would have had their calf removed. The blue line would represent cows that kept their calf with them until a more traditional 180-day weaning. So as you can see, once the cow gives birth to her calf, then her needs begin to climb. And at peak lactation, they begin to drop off a little bit, but they stay very high until weaning clear out when the calf is about um, six months old. But the cow that um, is early weaned, her needs drop tremendously. So the cow in the, in the bottom picture of the slide we just saw would have had her needs down here at the bottom of this red line where it's at its lowest, whereas the cow with the calf would have had her needs clear up here at 18 megacals a day. So it's very critical. Um, to keep those energy needs in mind and to provide the right ones. Because the other thing that we ask cows to do right after peak lactation is breeding. And so for them to cycle again, they must have adequate nutrition. Another thing that we have to think about when we are um, have confinement cows is the dry matter intake of the calf. We have research that suggests that the calf is eating 1% of his body weight in forage dry matter by the time he's three months old. So if he is not early weaned and he's not in his own pen eating his own diet, the diet that we're providing to the cow must also begin to include some feed for the calf, or we need to provide a means for him to have access to feed in addition to what she has, because he will begin to eat out of the bunk with her fairly quickly. We can do this in a number of ways. So the next slides that I'm going to show you are ways that we can manipulate diets to increase the energy for the given stage of production of the cow and the needs of the calf. So this slide shows, in the left-hand column, uh, dry matter ratios of the ingredients in the second column. So for example, um, in this first row, this diet would be 57% distiller's grains on a dry matter basis, not an as-is, but with the moisture removed, and 43% straw. The next diet down would be 30% distiller's and 70% straw. So a lot more energy in this 57-43 mixture than in this 30-70 mixture. Okay, and there are a couple of other diets um, that showing how other um, byproducts and, and other feeds can be added in and still make a nice energy dense diet for limit feeding. So this one has distillers, straw, and silage in uh, a 40-20-40 proportion. And the bottom one has distillers, grains, straw, and beet pulp in a 20-35-45 um, mixture. So what it allows us to do then, if we come, come on over here, we can look at um, the needs of the late gestation cow. And we see that this first diet, the 57-43 diet, would meet her needs with 15 pounds of dry matter. Not the actual amount of feed, but the dry matter. So if that diet was a 
um, dry matter mixture, then it would take 30 pounds of actual feed to feed her 15 pounds. Okay, we always have to make that uh, conversion before we actually feed. But if that cow is lactating, we can just increase the pounds of diet that are being given to her. And then we can also increase it again to give her more feed for her calf. Another thing that we could do, if we look at this 5743 and compare it to the 3070, um, we see that this diet is not as energy dense. And so we could be feeding 19 pounds of this to the late gestation cow. And then we could feed 18 pounds to the lactating cow of this more energy dense diet. And so we really didn't make a huge adjustment in the amount of feed that she was given, but we did increase the energy quite a bit. So that's two ways we can manipulate the diet for um, the different production stages for the cow and to account for the calf. Here's another example of a way to feed the calf um, a diet without him having to compete to, with the cow. The cow in the background cannot get under here. Um, this was actually taking, this, these pictures were taken by a, in a lot in Kansas, in Syracuse, Kansas. This is the same diet that's being fed to the cows, but this amount of bunk space is pretty much limited to the calf. In our research feedlot, here is a creep feeder in the back of the pen that the cow cannot access. And we put alfalfa pellets in there for the calves to eat. They did nibble on them. We saw the calves eating at the bunk with the cows quite a bit. But this does give the calf a chance to get in there and, and maybe initiate some room and function at a very early age and get them started eating some feed that they're not competing with the cows for. The shade um, also provided uh, a good relief from the sun in this particular case. As I mentioned earlier, these calves were born in the summer. If the bull is put in with the cows and the cows are in confinement during the breeding season, then we need to account for the feed needs of the bull when he's in there with the pairs. So bulls need another 15 to 18 pounds of TDN and another two foot of bunk space um, to be accounted for their needs while the breeding season is in place. So to summarize the important points of this webinar, Limit feeding energy dense diets may be the most cost effective diets um, to have in confinement rather than ad lib or allowing the cows to eat all that they want of a less dense diet. But using the correct TDN values to formulate those diets will be critical, particularly for ma managing the economics of the diet. Critically important to be aware of the changing nutritional needs of the cow and her calf as they move through phases of production and are still in confinement. And remember, the calf begins to eat feed within the first week or two of life. And so some means of providing um, dry matter for that calf is an important part of this confinement feeding as well. And should producers choose to use bulls or to even use cleanup bulls after AI, bull feed has to be accounted for and um, needs to be included during their stay in confinement as well. That concludes this webinar on the nutritional needs of confined cows. And questions can be directed to the email address, the phone number, or the website listed on this slide. Thank you.